Good morning, everyone. My name is Lloyd Albert. I head of Public and Government Affairs at AAA Northeast, and I'm delighted to have all of you join us this morning. When this pandemic began uh, back in March, uh, the in-person outreach we've been doing here in AAA for nearly, you know, for decades really, came to an abrupt halt. We quickly transitioned to the virtual world and began doing scores of, of webinars and, and presentations ever since, allowing us to connect in a, in a really meaningful way with our members and our stakeholders. This morning, we continue our town hall series with a very special guest, Rhode Island Senior Senator Jack Reed. Now, one could argue that the Senator needs no introduction, but please allow me to take just a few moments to highlight the Senator's distinguished career as a dedicated and exemplary public servant. Um, after graduating West Point, he served with distinction in the US Army, earned degrees from Harvard's Kennedy School and Harvard Law, and served Rhode Island as a state senator for three terms, followed by three terms representing the state's second district in the US Congress. He was first elected to the US Senate in 1996 and is now serving his fifth term as our senior senator. And just recently, he assumed the chairmanship of the Armed Services Committee, in addition to his senior roles on appropriations and banking and on a host of Senate subcommittees. And with that, let me say good morning to you, Senator, and welcome. How are you? I'm doing very well. Yourself? Not bad. So just keep working. That's my motto. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And that, and that you do for sure. Senator, there, there's certainly no shortage of, of uh, issues to talk about these days, but I thought we'd kind of focus the conversation today on something that directly affects our AAA members and, and motorists in general, a discussion about America's transportation future. But before we do that, I'd like to get a sense from you about the general state of play in Washington. Um, can you give us a sense of whether you believe bipartisanship is a real possibility in this highly charged environment? Well, it's still a bit early. I mean, there is uh, bipartisan support of many of the nominees coming up uh, from the White House, uh, President Biden's nominees. Uh, we uh, managed to get uh, Secretary Austin confirmed Secretary of Defense with overwhelming support and his deputy uh, passed by voice vote. So there was no controversy there. So in the sense of not nominees, with a few exceptions, uh, there is a bipartisanship. Uh, which is typical. We, uh, we uh, extended the same kind of uh, courtesies in most cases uh, to our, all of our, our uh, previous presidents. Uh, there's lots of turmoil, though. I mean, you don't have to be an insider to recognize the, the, the lines in the Republican caucus between the Trump supporters and Senator McConnell and the, the back and forth there. I don't know how that's going to play out. That might even help bipartisanship because uh, uh, Senator McConnell particularly might recognize or determine that you know getting things done is the best uh, uh, way to get his message out to, uh, to the American people and his constituents. So that might be one factor. Um, uh, when we get down to the legislation, that's where we no longer, we actually need bipartisan. We can't get anything on a committee because they're divided exactly down the middle unless you get Republican and Democratic votes together. And so what I sense is, and I think we're going to work towards, is uh, that middle ground, you know, flight, right of center, left of center, come together uh, because we know we have some very sincere folks on both sides, but they're on very far sides of the question. So we have to work for that middle ground. And it's it's early yet, but we'll we'll know more in a few weeks uh, when we start tackling the, the big infrastructure program. Now, speaking of a, a big item, uh, you know, the Biden administration is taking decisive action on the pandemic for sure. What other things need to happen in your mind uh, to help people who are struggling in the middle of this unprecedented health crisis? And well, I, I asked I asked specifically in reference to the America Rescue Act. That's being well, I think we have to get that done uh, because what we've seen is a uh, uh, sort of a slowing down in some respects of the economy, although there was some encouraging uh, numbers in terms of retail sales last quarter. Uh, but we're seeing a very, very weak employment market. And we're also beginning to recognize 
that some jobs won't come back because we've accelerated the, 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 the deployment of technology with webcast. This is one example of that. And, you know, going into a restaurant and the, the, the menu is on a uh, little thing you put your phone up to. All those things would have happened, but they wouldn't happen as quickly. So we're seeing that. Uh, so employment's a, a, a key issue. And then uh, what we won't, don't want to do is fall so far behind that we encourage a deep recession that will take years to come out. And look, listening to most economists and on both sides of the, of the middle, if you will, uh, they're urging that you know we go big, and I think we should go big. Uh, other issues are important too. We housing, you know, there's been a tremendous backlog of uh, evictions uh, that, if they're instituted in one fell swoop, would be devastating to communities all across the country. We've got problems with the people who are behind in their mortgages, et cetera. So, you know, we're trying to, uh, you know, keep. Uh, a steady sort of level so when the economy when the disease is defeated the economy comes back then people are ready to move out go back to work get their jobs and, and you know they haven't lost everything in the interim and that's critical and uh, that's the biggest issue with the COVID-19 package it's keep, it's keeping everybody sort of whole uh, so they can start afresh and with you know some momentum when we, the economy comes back. Now, switching now to, to transportation-related matters, the American public heard repeatedly over the last four years, let's go big on infrastructure, let's do something, and it proved to be pretty elusive, if you will. Uh, generally, how concerned are your, are your colleagues in the, in the Senate and, and in the House, for that matter, on dealing with this crumbling infrastructure across the country? Well, we've got a very good lesson about crumbling infrastructure the last week in Texas. <laughs> So I think that actually has uh, awoken a lot of my colleagues to the concerns. Uh, and the other issue too, which uh, it was related to climate activities and climate change. And that's something that's coming on with, with you know, with faster than we can cope with it at the moment. So those two issues before were kind of, in some quarters dismissed as not critical, but now I think there'll be more take up. Um, you're right. You know, President Trump, one of his campaign promises was a big trillion dollar infrastructure package. It never materialized. And we're four years behind the curve. In fact, we're probably many, many years behind the curve. So we do have to have a big infrastructure package. Uh, that is going to require, as we talked initially, uh, bipartisanship and cooperation, because we will need uh, 60 votes to get it through the Senate. And you'll need, I think, a bipartisan effort in the House. But the, the appealing thing about that is everyone understands that it's not a regional issue. It's not a, an issue for the Northeast, et cetera. It's everywhere in different ways. Uh, and I think we'll try to work off that common feeling and, and then start delivering real uh, solid progress. The other point in terms of uh, developing infrastructure is that it, it also puts people to work. And again, we're concerned about keeping employment up and giving people particularly uh, you know construction work as other people uh, access uh, to good jobs and solid jobs now even though we didn't have a big infrastructure package over the last few years we've we've managed to put money into the infrastructure i know uh supporting transit uh supporting uh bridges particularly i was able to put a program together as the uh, ranking member of the Appropriations Subcommittee on Transportation uh, to fix the bridges in the most critical, well, the most efficient bridges in the country. We took a target, the, the worst bridges, and we addressed it. That would provide extra money for several states to, to do work. So, you know, we've been working at it slowly, but we do need a bigger, more intense program. I heard something very disturbing last week that if we do go big, as the president is suggesting on the Rescue Act, that it might jeopardize funding, available funding for transportation. That doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but I'd like to know your, your thoughts on that. Uh, I think there is a, we understand that, you know, there are 
several different dimensions. One is capital infrastructure that needs significant repairs because it's been neglected for years. But also there's operating supports that are necessary, particularly for transit, for rail. And there is, uh, I think, not only room for, but the necessity to have both. So the, the, the idea of paying for infrastructure improvements by taking away support for transit or support for um, uh, operations of, of, of infrastructure it doesn't make sense to me. It's one piece. So I would hope we wouldn't go down that path, and I don't think we will. Good, good. Uh, we've seen uh, two or three large five-year reauthorizations needing extension after extension. We just couldn't get it together to, to, to reauthorize for five more years. This most recent one, the FAST Act, was again extended for a year. I think at basically level funding. What, what do you think the prospects are for a thoughtful approach to that when this uh, FAST Act expires in September? I th we're going to take that up. Um, President Biden is very much committed to getting legislation. He has spent, as you know, many years in, in the Senate, so he's someone who understands the importance of having a, a current authorization that reflects not what was current five years ago and just continued on, but what is important today. So I think we will. Uh, the committees are ready to move. Again, this will be the test of the you know bipartisanship of getting that sort of group of uh, you know uh, Republican and Democrats together to move a piece of legislation, get it to the floor. Uh, once again, that's a topic that's less divisive than many other topics. So I would say that has a more than even chance of making progress. We hope that is in fact the case. Now, you mentioned uh, some nominees have been uh, confirmed already. Uh, Mayor Pete Buttigieg was one who has been confirmed on an 86, I think, 13 vote. Um, what do you see as his big challenges in this first year, uh, Senator? Well, I mean, we'll go right back to your previous question. Like, he's, he's got to be sort of the architect behind the scenes of the FAST Act, the new FAST Act. He's going to be working with both sides and giving them kind of a technical advice from the Department of Transportation. He also has to be the, the salesperson for that, going out around the country, highlighting the deficiencies that we have to correct, and coming up with you know, you know ideas that are you know, not only sensible, but uh, are sort of forward-looking. Uh, how do we uh, create an environment where uh, electric vehicles will be uh, more common? That's going to happen. We know that. But what do we have to do to support that? And what are the trade-offs? And what do we have to compensate for? So that's, that's, that'll be a critical role he'll play. And um, and I think he has both the talent and the energy to do it. Uh, that's why he was, you know, I think, supported in a bipartisan way. Yeah, he was on one of the cable networks last week talking about electrification and how things are moving in a very different direction. And he, he really sounded enthusiastic. He brought enthusiasm to the issue, which I thought was pretty refreshing. So yes. I, I agree with that he's up for the task, uh, certainly, and he's going to have a very full agenda for sure. Um, you probably get asked this all the time, but you know the, the gas tax hasn't been raised in literally since 1993, right. so almost 30 years now. And yeah. there are many who say it, it's not, it's no longer a viable way to fund the highway trust fund, and we should be looking at a vehicle miles tra traveled fee or road user charges in general. Right. Uh, I know it's being tested in, in Oregon. I think the FAST Act has provisions in it to make it a, a pilot program in, in several states. Where are we going with that whole issue, Senator? Well, uh, I think you're uh, spot on in terms of the gas tax. Uh, in fact, since 2008, we've contributed $157 billion from the general fund to go into the uh, highway right. fund so that we can keep maintaining highways and then building new ones or re revising those that have built. So we have to look for different uh, sources. And then the other factor too, and, and we alluded to in our discussion of electric cars, you know, to me the most uh, significant sign is that the auto companies have basically announced that they're going all electric within the next 
several years, then that says to me that businessmen and women have decided that that's the direction that the consumer is going. They want to get there first, et cetera. So almost by definition, that's a further uh, uh, problem with the gas tax. <laughs> People oh, will use electricity. So, so we have to look for a different uh, approach. And, you know, some of the things you mentioned of just, you know, a mile a vehicles, mile travel tax that the MT has been discussed. I think locally, and this is one of the advantages of the state as a laboratory of new ideas, I think they should be looked at in terms of different approaches to paying for the ongoing repair and upkeep of highways. And uh, because we all sense that we're going in, in a direction where electric cars will be more and more prevalent. And as a result, we have to find a funding mechanism that uh, recognizes that reality. Yeah, and you're right. You know, uh, Volkswagen has said no more uh, fossil fuel burning internal combustion engines after 2030. I actually read yesterday, I think it was Aston Martin, the big, oh, Bentley it was, but more importantly, Chevy and Ford are all kind of saying the same thing. We saw uh, Governor Newsom in California talk about uh, banning the sale of uh, internal combustion engines by 2035. Ontario followed suit or Quebec and Canada. So it's, it's really happening and accelerating. So I yeah. think electrification is a, is a big factor and hopefully your colleagues recognize that. And I think they do. And I think one of the aspects that's encouraging, it, it, it's, uh, it'll be a market transformation. It won't be some type of kind of, kind of uh, command decision. Uh, and that, uh, as I said before, the, the, the automobile companies recognize that. that they're, they're looking ahead and they're trying to maximize profit and cater to their consumers and they see this coming. Uh, and it, we have to go understand and prepare for it too. And that's where our role comes in. Uh, it, I'm told it takes fewer people to build an electric car and I'm told it takes fewer people to maintain an electric car. So that falls over into a problem that we have as government. How do you replace those good jobs? So that's that's one factor. And again, having been doing this for a couple of years, uh, you know, there's two sides of the coin. There's that really great side that says, wow, electric cars, no pollution, et cetera, and then flip it over and say, well, how do we compensate for displacement of jobs? And, and we have to do that consciously. So as we're looking at this electric revolution, we also have to look at some of the consequences and we will, and we will be doing that. Great. Uh, North Atlantic Rail Initiative is a $105 billion project over 20 years. It's pretty, yeah. pretty gargantuan, monumental in its scope. And it really has great promise, I think, from New York to Boston, legacy cities around New England being tied in. What, what's your take on, 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 that, on that initiative, uh, Senator Reid? Well, uh, uh, first of all, I think it's a good idea. I mean, I think rail is, uh, again, when we talk about pollution, when we talk about uh, you know, climate change, uh, uh, rail, particularly as we electrify the rail systems and get away from diesel, are really good answers to uh, commuting and, and moving around. Uh, the, the proposal would require the, the governors of the states to enter into some type of compact. They would appoint a board uh, and that board would have to have some uh, a power if they're going to be effective, even condemnation perhaps. So I think it's a great idea, but I think uh, one of the issues is the devil's in the details. You know, how do they set up the board? Uh, what powers do they have? Uh, uh, and I found too, and you probably found also too, when you're trying to route different rail lines, you come into to, to people who are really concerned about changing their their community. Uh, we had a, a few years ago, there was discussions about altering the, the route of the Amtrak lines through Southern Rhode Island and, and Connecticut. And there was quite a bit of public opposition to moving the lines because they impacted farms and uh, their way, way of life. So all of these things are gonna be very, very challenging, but I think we have to, you know, do them eventually. One thing I think the first step might be uh, just electrifying 
all the commuter lines we have right now. That's a, a feasible first step so that we do cut down on, on pollution. And uh, also, you know, improving uh, service time and uh, so that will attract more customers. And when you build up this demand for railroads or rail service, it'll help this overall plan because people do, you'll have more popular support. People will say, listen, I use the rails, this is great. So a lot of what we've been talking about has national implications, of course, but when we kind of zero in on the ocean state here in Rhode Island, um, we have 450,000 members here in the state, for example, who are very interested in roads and bridges. And what I've learned over the years is AAA members are not only motorists, they're also bicyclists. They, they, they're pedestrians, they use rail, light rail, they use the MBTA to Boston. Um, what do you see as the biggest challenges facing? Uh, before I say that, let me, let me just make a comment. Uh, you have been extraordinary in your leadership on all of this issue and bringing funds to Rhode Island that have moved us forward as we are dealing with structurally deficient bridges, for example. I uh, really can't thank you enough for the leadership and the focus you've maintained on our, our, our state over here. So what do you see locally as our biggest challenges uh, with the great leadership we have at, at DOT right. and in here? Uh, well, you know, first we have to, uh, you know, bounce back from the pandemic. Uh, we've been tr keeping, for example, TF Green operating, uh, but at a very, very uh, diminished capacity or diminished flights. So we have to get that back going, but we've managed to put money into green so that they so far weathered the storm. Uh, that's one point. Uh, the bridges, uh, the Rhode had the worst bridges in the country and uh, we've managed, I think, to get upwards uh, uh, roughly over a hundred million dollars over the last uh, three or four years for bridge repairs. And we're, we're redoing the Henderson Bridge. We're doing, you know, every, what I, play, uh, I like to see is everywhere I turn, there's a bridge that's being rebuilt or a road that's being rebuilt. So we've done a lot of work, but we still have to do more. Um, and then uh, I think commuter rail, uh, we have got to help that along. Uh, we're building a new station in Pawtucket and Central Falls that I think will help. If we can electrify the commuter rail, that would be helpful. The other issue we're working on is getting a stop by Amtrak at TF Green Airport. Uh, we got uh, some resources to allow the state and Amtrak to begin to explore that in a very serious way. And Amtrak is replacing their locomotives with sort of uh, dual capability, both electric and, and diesel. So that'll help because they can they can switch on the diesel for a moment come into green without a catenary system and then switch back on so th those are some of the things we want to do uh, and that requires the, not only this infrastructure program but also continuing to every year provide the resources the state needs uh you've been an, a, a good friend to transit as well senator and i think scott abadesian might be uh, on the call this morning uh how do you see us moving forward and enhancing and increasing ridership uh, on on RIPTA and yeah. in general? Well, I you know we've uh, uh, supported RIPTA because it's central to so many people's uh, lives, and uh, there you know there are people who without RIPTA could not get to their job, could not get to doctor's appointments, could not take care of really take care of their family. And it's essential. So we're trying to enhance Riptor. And I think some of the improvements are particularly down in Providence, the bus routes, uh, talking about uh, creating different locations for pickups. I was very pleased to help the state when they created two bus hubs, one at CCRI and one at the University of Rhode Island. So that's an obvious place that you can capture hopefully a lot of riders uh, who don't have cars but can get up to Providence and get around and get get to school on time. Uh, so that's one aspect of it too. Uh, we're, uh, we're doing some experiments. So the RIPTA has a project going in Central Falls where they've uh, been able to uh, create a system where people can get on the bus literally ride for free. And that uh, is to encourage transit and also to give people uh, who are probably going to entry-level jobs a little advantage so where they don't have to, 
you know, take from their meager paychecks of money to go pay for transit. So we're trying to do that and make it uh, more effective. And then one other factor I mentioned too is, and this is we're doing this and we've worked with RIPTA for years, is making the system uh, more uh, efficient in the sense that people know exactly when the bus is arriving. And they've built in some software. In fact, I was uh, out with my staff and talking about this and uh, one of my, they're all young, by the way, pointed <laughs> out that if you went to your cell phone, you could find out when the next bus is stopping over at the, across the street. And I said, right. oh, but that's the type of, particularly for this, uh, the new, younger generations where they expect, look at the cell phone, okay, the, the bus will be here in seven minutes, real, and are accurate real time. That'll help too. So this combination of many factors. Yeah, and selfishly, you know, we have a 1,600 people working at the AAA in the state here, and many of them use transit to get back and forth to our headquarters building. So enhancements in transit are, are critical, I think, to the state. I knew we were going to be running very tight on time. It would, it would fly by. Let me just ask you a question that I think is very important on a go-forward basis. is transportation equity. And we talk about equity and social reckoning, all of this, right? But how do we really address the issues of of inequity in the transportation sector going forward. I know it's probably on your radar and, and everyone else as well. Can you give us your thoughts on that? Well, you know, that, that issue I just mentioned of the, the project they're doing in Central Falls, which is probably one of the poorest communities in the state, and they're now uh, you know, allowing uh, people to get on the bus, ride free to their destination. That's, that's one example. Uh, you know, I, again, the providing, uh, as we do, passes for seniors who their incomes are usually constrained so that they have access and make it convenient for them to, to get on the bus. Uh, and, you know, again, uh, consciously looking at the routes so that we're not bypassing uh, neighborhoods that would depend exclusively or, or depend significantly on on transit uh you know that's what we've got to do constantly and and i believe ripter is you know we're fortunate uh, because ripter has been well led scott uh did a terrific job there and his predecessors and we've got a dedicated uh staff all the way through from i've been through there a number of times the mechanics the drivers everyone and uh it's something we should be very proud of a statewide i think one of the few, if not the only statewide transit system in the, in the country, and it does very, very well. And I wonder if uh, uh, electric vehicle rebates, for example, not only for Teslas or high-end cars, but for you know your basic uh, oh. Nissan Leaf, uh, important considerations as well, I think? I think that's right. I think anything we can do to incentivize and make the incentives, uh, you know, even think about making them refundable because some people, you know, tax system, the, the incentive's great, but it, but if they don't have make enough money to, to, to have, you know, pay taxes, and even though they're working 40 and 50 hours a week, then uh, that's something that we should think about too. But you're right, uh, uh, particularly as we've talked about previously, the direction we're heading is electric uh, vehicles, and we should let everyone sort of participate. So last question, Senator. Uh, we talk a lot about AVs, autonomous vehicles, and I think five years ago, people were saying, eh, by 2021, 22, we're not going to see them in the short term. But do you see yourself riding along in, the, in an AV not too long from now? What, what are your thoughts? Prognostications? No, no. I, 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 I think... Uh, this technology is is already here, uh, and it takes a while to 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 deploy it effectively in a commercial uh, vehicle. But uh, the work they're doing, uh, and again, this is something where I think the companies themselves understand that uh, AV is going to be a, a, a force in the future. I'm told that and one of the first areas to look at is. Uh, uh, trailer tractor trailers uh in fact uh, i guess about a year ago they had a symbolic uh, you know automated vehicle convoy of beer trucks 
of course, it was four o'clock in the morning and they had police in front and behind right. and, they were and got in. But, then, you know, you, you look back at history and, you know, I'm sure there were a bunch of people uh, while the Wright brothers were tinkering with their plans saying, come on, that's, you know, give me a break, you know. Uh, it happens. And I think this is one of those technologies that's just going to move forward. In fact, AI is going to be so cr critical. We're having a hearing that this week in the Armed Services Committee about artificial intelligence and other technologies that are going to reshape the, the whole society and particularly and I have no surprise also military operations and tactics so senator uh let me again congratulate you on your chairmanship of the armed services thank committee you. we're so proud uh let me thank you for your leadership let me thank you for raising the bar in terms of integrity and and uh civility in washington and thank you for everything you're doing for the state of uh, state of Rhode Island. We really appreciate. And you you came to our office three or four years ago, and I remember people lining up to to say hi to you and shake your hand and everything else. There's a lot of AAA members uh, uh, employees on this call again this morning. So yeah. we thank you, and we thank the entire audience for joining us and uh, and for your time. So well, please stay safe and well. As a AAA member, thank you for all the good work you do. And <laughs> okay. I think about 50 years, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So, you know, oftentimes someone will say that. I mean, Let me see your card. You know, I want to see your proof. We're not going to do that. No. <laughs> We're not going to do that today. But again, thank you so much for your time, Senator. Thanks. It's been great. Yes, sir. Be well. Yes, thank right. you.